and you mentioned so two quick things so one um are all of the borrowers nonprofits? Um, seems like yes. yes. Um, and just for folks in the audience today um, that say, well, a nonprofit borrowing, that makes me feel uncomfortable, or a nonprofits can borrow money too? Like, huh? Let's, let's unpack that for a second. Yeah. So, um, in fact, let me tell you a little bit about how the start of Lendonate has something to do with you too, Mark. <laughs> so, when I first got the idea of Lendonate, or what became Lendonate, I had first um, gone to uh, my business school um, and talked to Professor Nora Silver, who heads up the nonprofit um, a, a division of the, the Center for Nonprofit. Uh, they have a new name, but um, anyway. So uh, I asked her for her thoughts. She kind of gave it a preliminary thumbs up, like, that sounds like, like a good idea but you know, you should talk to so-and-so. And then that so-and-so said, you know, if anybody knows anything about this, talk to my friend, Mark. And so remember <laughs> that's how we <laughs> initially connect. I'm like, hey, you know, what do you think? So as you already knew before I did, in this nonprofit um, ecosystem, nonprofits, of course, borrow just like any, they're for for-profit peers. They need yeah. to, access to capital is important. There is, over $600 billion of nonprofit loans outstanding in this country. As a reference point, that's almost 80% of the US consumer credit card debt. Wow. So when people think like, oh, do nonprofits borrow or should they? Uh, the answer has been, <laughs> the, the answer is out there. But <laughs> I, I should say just like also their for-profit peers, of, of peers, a lot of the, uh, the the loans are for real estate right finance yeah i was right? going to say that's probably a lot of it is real estate and affordable right. housing and yeah. yeah you think of the the schools the hospitals or the nonprofit mm -hmm. schools hospitals you know mm -hmm. um uh religious uh organizations are heavy mm -hmm. consumers of uh real estate so a lot of financing goes there but a lot of them also go to bridge financing and other yeah. equipment financing yeah and um Going back to to the uh, a couple minutes ago around uh, and investors and you said you know the the lenders uh, would go into lend donate and choose and you know um, it's tough to think of yourself as a lender if you're you know a donor sitting on the you know watching this video or whatever but you know they would be a lender um, but explain. Um, a lender profile, if you would, who are you typically seeing and where does the money come from? Is it from my, you know, Bank of America, like, you know, savings account or um, is it from a, a donor advice fund or, or how does it work, Vivian? Yeah, for uh, regulatory reasons, uh, that's probably too boring for a, a fun podcast like this. Um, we do need to only accept accredited investors and that mm -hmm. term is defined by the SEC. Basically, it just means you know more high net worth individuals. And if it's uh, organizations, they also need to be accredited. There's definition of how they get accredited. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our first of all, the the lenders are has to, has to fall into that category. Then within that, let's just take individuals. Um, I personally have made loans in every, uh, I think without exception, every single loan we put out. And I do it from my, uh, I always like to eat my own cooking. <laughs> and so I um, I do it from my regular investment accounts. I do it from my retirement accounts. I haven't quite done it yet, but the third one that I can do is to um, invest from my donor advice fund. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so that's helpful to know. And, and you know, obviously if you wanted to learn more about how to connect with Lendonate, talk to Miss Sue and you'll learn all about Lendonate. Um, so, but, you know, talking about the DAFs and the donor advice funds, um, you know, you and I are in this space, um, every day and it's interesting. It, it seems like, you know, again, it, it seems like it's, it's a, uh, growing in terms of popularity and under this auspices of, you know, uh, impact investing. Right. Um, and so. For our for our audience, define as you would impact investing. What does that what does that mean to you? And um, and what are you know? Let's start there. Yeah, to me, impact investing falls under the big umbrella, one of the subcategories of SRI, socially responsible investments. Mm -hmm. uh, under SRI, just like impact investment is 
Another one that people are familiar with, um, ESG investing for the environment, and there are a lot of mutual funds and, and ETFs um, in that space. So to me, impact investing um, em encompass the more direct investment, whether it's into communities directly, into nonprofits directly, uh, into, a so uh, into an investment that has social benefit. Mm. Um, like what maybe some people have some misconception, there's some misconception out there that impact investment, in order to qualify for that label, you have to t accept concessionary returns. And that is not the case. There are many, just like Lendonate, right? We give people a chance to invest at market rate, and it's their choice to um, you know, make concessionary rate if they want to. And then one argument would be, well, if it's not concessionary rate, then what impact are you making? And mm -hmm. here's what it is. Having been now on the side of underwriting for nonprofit like you, Mark, I'm sure you see the same thing as well. Sometimes completely legitimate applications get rejected by banks because banks, not that they don't want to help, is that banks are regulated in such a rigid sort of fashion that even the, all the bankers want to help, sometimes it just makes it hard. So mm -hmm. by making capital available already is impact. People can further improve it for further impact by accepting concessionary return, but that should be a personal choice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's you know uh, hours and hours of conversations about trying to tie um, social impacts to your investment. So I'm going to give you a million dollars, Vivian, but I want to make sure that your staff receives health care, you know, or, or, or whatever the issue may be. Um, so if there's a concessionary return. I, the lender or the investor, would like to see you provide some sort of social return as well, whether that's to Mother Earth or to your employees or both or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And if I may add one point to your uh, a question you asked earlier about innovation, and mm -hmm. my response was connectivity. And mm -hmm. so you actually just introduced that as well with your question uh, in the context of donor advice fund and impact investment. I've actually given um, kind of like a, a quick talk and titled it uh, Donor Advice Fund, My Superpower is Impact Investment. Right? <laughs> those go so well together because one large criticism, and I used to be on that side of criticizing Donor Advice Fund, is that it traps philanthropic dollars. The donor already received the benefit from you know tax benefits. But it's not in the it's not it's not with the nonprofit. It's just sitting it's in not the with the nonprofit, it's not doing any social good by sitting that's in- That's the big beef. That's the big beef. Until- <laughs> Until you realize, hey, I can unleash that power if I invest in the communities. So take um, CDFI as an example, right? If my uh, if CDFI is a choice for me in my donor advice fund, why wouldn't I, before I choose which nonprofit to receive my money as donations, um, invest in the communities that I care about first, and then the money goes out. So it's never really idle, it's providing um, impact in the communities just in different ways. So mm -hmm. I think that marriage really needs to happen more often. Yes, and um, we did that uh, at a foundation I used to work with. Um, I know. Years ago. So yeah, so I, I agree with you. The, the idle funds that are sitting in DAFs are a huge source of liquidity and capital for nonprofits and invest um, wisely. Um, but anyway, 